Okay, um, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. Uh, today we start our series of five webinars jointly organized by the Nuclear Energy Agency, NEA, and the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, FNEC, to explore further nuclear financing. Specifically, this webinar will focus on the financing of small modular reactors, looking at the challenges and opportunities. I'm Floria Kwong, head of the IFNEC Technical Secretariat. I'm particularly excited to moderate this webinar because today we will hear the, pers the perspectives of both SMR developers and customers, also the specific challenges and valuable lessons learned. On the customer side, we have two speakers today, uh, Mr. Kalev Kolimets, the CEO of Fermi Energy, who brings SMR to Estonia to meet its climate goals and to help uh, the economy develop. And Ms. Winnie Nubai, Director of Strategy and Planning at the Kenya Nuclear Power and Energy Agency. She will share the Kenyan experience of financing SMR. Then on the developer side, we have two speakers as well. Um, and they are Mr. Jeff Harper, the Vice President for Strategy and Business Development at X Energy. He will tell us how SMR deployment has evolved in this decade and how we get ready to capture the opportunity. Then Mr. Jia Xu Tian, President of Huolong Nuclear Power Technology in China. He will explain how SMR can be a game changer for the nuclear industry. Now, to help us summarize the current global SMR development situation, we have Ms. Deanne Cameron, Head of Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the NEA. She will provide a succinct summary of a recent NEA publication. I look forward to hearing how and why government support and, and international collaborations are key enablers in SMR development. Of course, your questions and comments are important to us. So I encourage you to send them in using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will have about 25 minutes to answer your questions after the panel discussion. There will be questions that we cannot get to today due to time constraints and complete answers for those questions will be posted on the IFNET webpage within a few days following this webinar. Also on the IFNET and NEA webpages, you will find a recorded version of this event. Now, before we delve into this exciting discussion, we are so happy to have the Director General of the NEA, DJ Matt Wood, and the Chair of IFNEC, Ms. Alicia Duncan, to say a few words. So please join me to welcome them. DJ Matt Wood, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Gloria, and uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for this discussion today uh, about small modular reactors and the financing uh, associated with them. Um, when I think about this issue, I think about um, how long the conversation about small reactors has been going on. Um, if you're um, as old as I am, which unfortunately is getting older all the time, um, you have heard this show before. And um, there have been at least three occasions over my career where small reactors were discussed prominently. Um, and this time, this third time around, which has been really underway for um, almost a decade, uh, as, as we have been watching the development of these small reactors, it does it, it is different in a very substantive way. Um, and in that difference, I'll take a moment to recognize um, the recent passing of a close friend of mine, Dr. Pete Lyons, who was Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy, um, when small modular reactors really made their most recent um, assertion. And it really, I think Pete had the vision to see that this time it was for real and that he was in a position to help it. So I think that many of us who are watching this um, resurgence of interest in nuclear and small modular reactors, that we, we owe um, a bit of that to Pete for his vision and understanding that this opportunity really existed. He really pushed this issue. And he and I debated about this quite a lot because I, I was a bit of a skeptic and he was very much convinced early on. So I, I give him credit for seeing it. And the reason that I was a bit skeptical is because the economics of small modular reactors has always been very difficult to fully assess. Um, many people point to the small size of, of small reactors as being the key difference between SMRs and large reactors, but it's really much, much more complicated than that. 
Um, there are many different um, factors that come into play when you're talking about bringing um, a manufacturing approach to nuclear uh, reactors. Uh, the infrastructure that is required, the regulatory issues that come into play, but also the financing. So we're going to have a conversation about financing uh, from people who are probably beginning to think about this a lot more closely, because as these technologies become closer to implementation, uh, financing will become increasingly important. When you look at small reactors, it isn't just simply the fact that they are small. It is that they provide flexibilities and possibilities that are very different from today's reactors. But at the same time, they present questions. And questions and uncertainties and unknowns are not issues that make the financing community very happy. Uh, so hopefully over the course of this conversation and other analyses to come, we'll begin to close some of those knowledge gaps and begin to be able to answer some of the questions that are faced by these reactors as they go forward. Um, some of the questions I think were addressed in a recent report that was released by the NEA that uh, Deanne Cameron will be discussing in just a few minutes, but it really is just the very beginning because there are over 70 different small reactor concepts uh, being developed around the world today. There are, many of them are very different. Many of them involve different technologies that we're accustomed to, um, but they all present um, interesting possibilities for the future. Over the next several years, as the number of reactors we begin to focus on begins to contract, I think we'll have a much better sense as to what we're confronting when it comes to the finance of small module reactors. But today, we'll give it our best shot. And today's conversation, I think, is an excellent start. And in that respect, I'm very pleased to be working very closely with the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation because the IFNEC brings something um, that is not part of the NEA uh, framework, which is countries that are first embarking on nuclear for the first time. Uh, countries in the parts of the world, such as Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, where we are not, uh, we don't have numbers. We're not very active. IFNEC is, and IFNEC brings a perspective about those countries and about their needs that have to be considered as these small reactors are, are developed. So I'm looking very forward very much to work with IFNEC um, as we go forward with this, next, this series of, of webinars and discussions. And I'm very pleased that the chair of IFNEC, Alicia Duncan, is with us here today uh, to talk a bit more about this from the IFNEC perspective. Um, so Alicia and I will be here for the, for the totality of this webinar and looking forward to engaging in the conversation. And uh, Alicia, with that, I give the floor to you and, and look forward to your opening comments. Thank you, Director General. Uh, greetings to my colleagues around the world. I'm excited to join you today for this session on financing SMRs. Uh, on behalf of the IFNEC membership, I want to welcome all of the guests. I hear that we are at about 500, and that is simply amazing. Uh, I want to thank our colleagues from Poland for their efforts to design this series, and a special thanks to the NEA technical experts as well as in NTE, as well as the Technical Secretariat, Gloria Clement and Jamie Lee for their superb organization and support for all that IFNIC does. Uh, we have a distinguished list of speakers assembled today and an ambitious agenda to cover, so I will be brief. We know that nuclear power project is complicated. Uh, DG Magwood has already told us that. It is expensive, it is hard to finance, and, and, and can be time consuming. But we also know that nuclear power plants support energy security, energy diversity, and combats climate change. So as we consider the value added of SMRs, we know that the world needs more clean energy and we need to figure out how to integrate nuclear and renewable so that the messaging that folks receive is that nuclear is a complementary solution and not a competitive one. And finally, we know that countries are facing increasing energy demands with a carbon, the need for a carbon-free solution. So what is our challenge? The challenge, as DG Magwood mentioned, is that the time is now. The time has been now, and DG Magwood was in fact the one to mention at our last in-person event at the White House in Washington, DC. The time is now. So the question is, we have a window of opportunity for SMRs as a climate change solution. And what are we gonna do about it? 
What do we know? We know that SMRs offer lower cost, shorter construction period, the factory assembly, scalability, and electric and non-electric applications. So what do we need to do? I guess our experts today will tell us. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. And with that, let's jump right in. Thank you very much, DG Matt Wood and Chair Duncan. Um, now, as our time today is limited, I will suggest we go through all our talks before opening the floor for questions and discussion. And with that, let's begin. Our first speaker is Ms. Deanne Cameron. Deanne will give us an overview of a recent NEA publication on SMRs, focusing on opportunities and challenges. Uh, now, let me quickly introduce uh, Ms. Cameron. Uh, currently, Deanne is head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the NEA. In this position, she leads an expert team of economists and scientists supporting nuclear policy development among NEA member countries. Her team performs economic assessment of nuclear financing and assists countries to reduce, uh, to reduce nuclear costs. Her group also monitors the evolution of nuclear technology, innovation, and the, and the fuel cycle. And before joining the NEA, Diane was with the Government of Canada as the Director of the Nuclear Energy Division. She led and coordinated Canadian public policy on nuclear energy and served as the Chair of Canada's Small Modular Reactor Roadmap and Action Plan. With that, Diane, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and, and very happy to be here with everyone today to kick off this series. Um, I, I'm actually going to, to speak a little bit from my current role, which is with the NEA as head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division, and I'll share with you some of the key findings of recent work by the NEA on small modular reactors. But I'm also going to complement that with some of the experience and knowledge that I gained over the past seven years. Um, having only recently left the Government of Canada in February of 2021, and, um, you know, over those seven years, I led SMR policy for Canada and, and gained a certain perspective from, from that experience as well. So if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm going to start with a little bit of context uh, before turning to opportunities and challenges for SMRs, as well as some of the key findings on economics and financing recommendations from uh, our recent report at the NEA on SMRs. First, starting with a little context. Um, yeah, okay, you could, this slide is fine for this. Um, every discussion about uh, energy innovation, uh, including nuclear energy innovation, exists within the context now of a global climate change crisis. And we know that every credible model shows that nuclear has an essential role to play in displacing carbon emissions, mitigating climate change, and enabling sustainable development. We know that affordable and reliable energy is a driver of economic development, and clean, affordable and reliable energy is a driver of sustainable development. Global installed nuclear capacity will need to grow dramatically to meet the world's emissions reductions targets by mid-century. And this will require life extension of existing power reactors. It will require build out of large scale new uh, nuclear at the gigawatt scale. And we now see very clearly a role for advanced and small modular reactors, SMRs, um, to also play uh, a, significant, uh, a significant and positive role. Before we go any further, let me pause to provide just a quick definition of small modular reactors in case there are folks joining us uh, for the first time exploring this topic. The topic is gaining momentum and more and more people who are not from the nuclear sector are engaging in the conversation, which is fantastic. So small modular reactors, as the name suggests, are small. Uh, that means they're smaller both in terms of their physical size and their power output as compared to conventional or large scale nuclear. So here we're specifically talking about any, any modular reactor that is less than 300 megawatts electric, but that goes all the way down to the micro reactors that are about five megawatts electric. They're modular, which implies that they're meant to be factory produced, manufactured, and shipped to site, and they are modular in the sense that they might also be scalable. 
Uh, they are reactors though, as the name implies, which means that somewhere at the middle of these things, there's a nuclear fission reaction that produces heat. And that heat can be used directly uh, to drive a turbine, or directly, or it can be used to drive a turbine to create electricity. Depending on the temperature of the reaction, and that varies by design of SMR, um, the heat might, might drive a steam turbine or a gas turbine, creating additional efficiencies. Which brings us to the opportunities for SMRs. Markets are signaling demand for smaller, simpler, inherently safe, affordable, and financeable nuclear power technologies. And those technology providers that can provide that combination of attributes, I think have the potential to see great success. Larger SMRs, because I told you there was a range between sort of five megawatts electric to up to 300 megawatts electric. So larger SMRs, in the range of 200 to 300 megawatts electric. Turn, turns out that that's a very convenient size, very well suited to replace coal power plants globally. Very small modular reactors, the micro reactors I mentioned at around five megawatts electric could have applications for off-grid um, remote sites, remote communities, uh, remote resource extraction sites. And high temperature SMRs, which could be either at the large end of the size spectrum or at the small end of the size spectrum, could have applications for heavy industry as the first real alternative to fossil fuel combined heat and power, like natural gas cogen. Turning to the next slide, please. And flexible nuclear, flexible SMRs that can dynamically load follow variable renewables and follow fluctuations in demand could enable even deeper penetration of variable renewables. Um, so really picking up on that point that Alicia made, that these are not competing necessarily with variable renewables. They're really complementary and they can enable uh, deeper penetration of, of variable renewables. SMRs can be used to desalinate water. They can be used to produce hydrogen. And for all of these reasons, all of these opportunities I've just mentioned, the global market for SMRs could be significant. Estimates vary, but multiple independent studies suggest that the global market for SMRs could exceed $200 billion per year by 2040. But SMRs and the nuclear ener energy sector more broadly continue to face many challenges. We have a high degree of confidence that the technology risks are manageable. From a technology readiness level, we're seeing significant advancement, some high technology readiness level and some strong development. So again, that technology risk seems very manageable to those of us in the nuclear sector, but there are other conditions for success. A vibrant nuclear sector requires public confidence, and this will be true for SMRs as well. And another important condition for success is regulatory readiness. The economics of advanced and small modular reactors have been modeled, but have yet to be proven and must be proven. And of course, projects must be financeable. And as was mentioned, there is some urgency. The time is now. There is a sense that there's a window of opportunity that's open. And if we had to put an estimate on it, and it's really, it's really more of a, a qualitative sense of it, the window is open now. We expect it to be open maybe for five to 15 years. In that time frame, we anticipate quite a few decisions to be made around the world that will lock in energy technology options. And so really SMRs need to be ready with all of the conditions for success uh, and they need to be ready soon. So turning to the next slide, I'll, I'll dive in a little bit more on the economics of SMRs. Various models suggest that SMRs could be competitive on the basis of levelized cost of electricity in some, but not all markets. But it's actually not as simple as just comparing levelized cost of electricity to levelized cost of electricity. Because as I already mentioned, the value proposition for SMRs is going to be different uh, than just providing power. They can also provide heat. They can be flexible. They can be load following. Um, and so, so we need to look at a, at a systems level costing model for, uh, for the economics of SMRs. Uh, we see that economic competitiveness of SMRs will depend on fleet economics, or as economists would say, economies of multiples, which will require modularization of design, simplification, 
and very importantly, standardization, all of which enable factory production and can bring to bear the benefits of advanced manufacturing. And to really enable fleet deployment across international boundaries, we need to make progress on international enabling frameworks for SMRs, including not only regulatory cooperation, but a much more ambitious goal of harmonization to the extent possible of licensing requirements, codes, and standards across international boundaries. These are the dynamics that are envisioned that will counteract the fact that we're making them smaller. Making them smaller, an economist's first reaction will be that that will bring diseconomies of scale. But we hope to introduce economies of multiples. And the way to do that is through the factors I've just referred to. Turning to the next slide. On finance, SMRs will only succeed if projects are financeable, which is the main theme of this NEA IFNEC webinar series. And this is the first of five discussions and it will be followed by a large workshop in Warsaw, Poland in 2022. Really looking forward to this, this series and, this, and the upcoming workshop in 2022 because this question of financing will be critical path for the success of SMRs. While some uncertainty remains, it is expected that affordability, scalability, and shorter payback periods will be attractive attributes for financiers. The inclusion of nuclear and SMRs in ESG, that is environment, social and governance uh, financing and climate financing, taxonomies and, uh, and, and green finance envelopes will also be important. Various models suggest a sensitivity in particular to the cost of capital, that is to say the depreciation rate. Um, and, and so these are, uh, these are the factors that need to be unpacked and explored, uh, but there is some hope uh, that by modularizing uh, the design and scoping down the scale of the projects, uh, each stepwise project becomes, uh, the risk of that project becomes more um, palatable, and more manageable, uh, and more appealing to financiers. Turning to the next slide, I'd be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention our NEA publication uh, and to give you the URL where you can find uh, where you can find it on our website. It expands on many of the points I've introduced today. And with my next and final slide, I'll quickly summarize the conclusions of our report. Um, it's been mentioned that there's a large number of SMR concepts uh, at different maturity levels in the innovation pipeline. Uh, there are still over, uh, over 70 proposed concepts around the world, uh, but this is across multiple applications. So I had mentioned there's some larger units that are well suited to coal replacement. There's some micro units that are well suited to off grid. There's some high temperature units. There's other units that aim to close the back end of the fuel cycle, which is a nuclear way of saying uh, recycle its own waste stream. And um, I would say though that in many countries that are looking to be first movers in deployment of SMRs, some front runners out of this group of 70 are coming to the fore. And uh, while I won't name any names, I will, uh, I will suggest uh, that operators are starting to take a very close look at, at technologies and are starting to select the technologies uh, for their short lists that they want to work with. Um, regulators, have started uh, looking at designs. And so you're seeing uh, regulatory assessment and some, some designs moving through, through the regulatory process more quickly than others. You're seeing some private investment and government financing. Some of those signals are starting to crowd in the investment. Um, you're seeing EPCs and others starting to join uh, joint ventures and partnerships with, uh, with the reactors that they want to build, that they want to they want to sign on with. So we are seeing some down selection happening through these competitive, uh, these competitive processes. A new delivery model, as I mentioned, is going to be uh, at the center of SMR competitiveness. Uh, we need to increase uh, the competitiveness through economies of multiples or economies of series is another way of saying the same thing. Um, deployment of multiples. Uh, that standardization so that we can really do manufacturing and factory production. Uh, there is a need to review the regulatory and legal frameworks, not only nationally, but internationally, uh, to ensure that 
uh, licensing requirements, codes and standards are risk-based, risk-informed, uh, and are not uh, overly prescriptive uh, and out of proportion, overly uh, with an, an un, uh, with, with an, uh, unmanageable administrative overhead that overshoots the, the risk of the, of the project. NEA countries are gaining experience in SMR development, uh, but challenges remain ahead. Uh, you'll see across, around the world, uh, countries are working on national programs, uh, Canada, the US, the UK, Russia, uh, others, um, and, and international collaboration, we believe at the NEA, uh, is going to be so important uh, to, to enable um, us to meet the time window that we have here. The, the time is now, uh, and, and especially for the advanced reactors, no single country can really bring them to bear uh, to commercialization uh, on its own. It's going to take some collaboration. It's going to take global value chains, international collaboration on technology, on economics, on financing, and on international enabling frameworks. So that's a really quick summary. And I hope that uh, sort of sets the stage for what I, I know will be a great discussion about, uh, about SMRs, about the opportunity, and about uh, the financing challenge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Diane, uh, for the very concise summary. Um, the conclusions are very clear to me. Now, uh, let me repeat that for audience who are interested in this report, um, it is downloadable on the NEA webpage. Okay, um, our next speaker is Mr. Caleb Kalinax. He will share with us the Estonian experience in enhancing SMR market development in Europe. Um, Dr. Kolometz is co-founder and CEO of Fermi Energy, a company established in early 2019 by Estonian nuclear energy professionals and businesses. The mission of Fermi Energy is to develop and deploy SMR in Estonia. Dr. Kolometz is an economist. He received his PhD degree in energy economics from the Tallinn University of Technology. He has extensive private and public sector experience from Estonian private energy companies and the Ministry of Economics Affairs. He also has served as uh, the Deputy Director of the Geological Survey of Estonia and a Member of Parliament in Estonia. Dr. Kolometz, over to you, please. Yeah, hello. I've uh, lived a couple of lives uh, indeed. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's a normal in Estonia, we are a small country to have uh, multiple roles. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, but yeah, I would go to, to uh, all my story about uh, Ferminergia and, uh, and Europe, uh, because we are in European Union. Uh, so this is our uh, founders team and, uh, and uh, the, we have now 12 uh, staff and uh, as I was speaking uh, last year, we were in the money raising. We concluded uh, basically uh, uh, few, a week ago the fundraising for this year, and we're now um, uh, we now raised total of close to four million uh, euros. Uh, and one special factor is that we we have one thousand three hundred investors, so uh, we are basically a publicly traded company. And, um, and indeed, 95% of those investors are, are Estonian. Uh, and yeah, it uh, was pretty amazing to me to see that uh, there were, originally we aimed to raise uh, half a million on the investment platform, and, uh, but the, the, the total subscription was 4.4. Uh, and uh, we closed uh, the, the fund money raising at uh, 1.68. And uh, the log logic, it was a bit complicated, like money raising always is, but uh, the logic here is the same as almost like, uh, like Tesla. So the, this, these technologies are, are interesting. And this is the fundamental. And, and obviously they, they have a, a, a ability to scale. They have a ability to, to be future technology. And therefore it is possible to um, explain based on your capability to, uh, of, of the team uh, of uh, executing, that uh, it is possible to move forward with uh, this technology. And uh, luckily, the Estonian government uh, decided um, already last November to form 
the nuclear energy working committee this was approved by the new uh, government and uh, the nuclear energy working committee which is effectively nepio in our country uh, was established in may uh, early may this year um, so and we are also proud that uh, Tractable Henri is uh, one of our newest uh, shareholders and uh, in two weeks we will announce another major shareholder in, in Ferminerga. So, uh, and, and underlying all of it is, is the, what, what I'm going to explain now. So the CO2 price right now in Europe is 56 euros, which is uh, well above uh, 60 dollars in, in American dollars and more than 70 dollars in Canadian so um, and the earlier this year the prediction was that the annual average will be 36 so uh, and we have to reach zero and that will be legally binding uh, very soon in july the commission will come up uh, with a package of uh, fit for 55 which will include um, uh, carbon uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism so every everyone from china and uh, and uh, around the world who wants to import their uh, steel and products to produce to, to Europe uh, pretty, pretty pay close attention because um, all of your carbon emissions will be tariffed effectively uh, 2023 from January. That is the objective. So we have to reach carbon neutrality and this is the law of the land. And in, in this vein, the, a lot of coal capacity uh, will be shut down. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of nuclear capacity as well in Germany, notably, but that, uh, also, unfortunately, in Belgium, in UK, in, in Sweden, some units have been shut down. So there is a massive amount of dispatchable capacity being shut down. And what is relevant in our perspective, being in Estonia, which is uh, the, the small country with uh, two bigger islands uh, uh, south of Finland, uh, we, uh, together with Latvia and Lithuania, will uh, disconnect from Russian grid system end of 2025. And currently we are importing something like, um, annually, something like uh, eight terawatt hours from Russia and Belarus. And this will be disconnected. So we have a, uh, well, certain level of gap <laughs> in the supply. So the, the prices are already uh, today uh, you can look up a uh, uh, North Pole spot. Uh, today's prices in Europe, uh, mainland Europe, are 73 euros per megawatt hour. So if that would be annually average, you don't need any carbon. Uh, you don't need any CFD or uh, FID uh, uh, financial support from the government. You can do merchant. And if you understand that the carbon prices have to move to 100 in Europe uh, by 2030, uh, it's, it's an incredibly strong story uh, to, uh, to move fo forward with uh, SMR deployments. What is you know, also incredibly wonderful is that the United States is really waking up at last, at last. I think uh, obviously the nuclear story started with uh, Enrico Fermi and, uh, <laughs> and many people doing uh, magnificent work in, in, in the Manhattan Project and uh, uh, the recover uh, uh, work in uh, for the Navy and uh, developing the PVR and uh, G developing the BBR and uh, Candos and so forth. But um, so the, the original story is is from the Americas, and I'm so so very pleased that um, Tennessee Valley Authority is uh, seriously looking at the SMR deployment. Um, obviously, Mrs. Cameron had a, a extensive role in in the Canadians. Uh, starting to look at SMRs very seriously. And I'm very pleased that uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta are, are committing to SMR deployments to shut down their fossils. And, and also that the Canadian has a solid uh, uh, carbon neutrality policy and carbon pricing policy in place that uh, uh, supports that uh, economically. So back to Europe. Um, indeed, we have to phase out all fossil fuel and power generation even before 2050 because the power sector is the easy part. Uh, agriculture, it's the industrial, uh, this is the hard part. So in power generation, we have to reach uh, zero by 2040. That is the easy part. Um, so <laughs> the, 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 it's very clear to see the, the economic case for, for uh, SMR uh, if, you, if you understand the economics. Uh, yeah, uh, we need 
in Europe multiple new deployment projects. And if you understand that, that, uh, uh, that uh, the deployment is one part of the business and then construction is another part of the business and then asset management like operation or power generation is a third part of the business. And you understand that each of those parts of businesses have to be financed uh, on their own in a market economic setting. Then you're not anymore in 20th century where you had to have the, well, all the money up front and, and finance it uh, upright. Um, then you are able to understand that the, each of those businesses are is, is a separate financial opportunity or uh, different people uh, or institutions financing it. So development financing, construction financing and asset financing are totally different things. Total different institutions are involved. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> normally, yeah, normally financial engineers don't meet uh, in nuclear engineers. That's that is one of the problems as well. So um, and yeah, I, I fully agree that we have standard have to have standardized design. Now, a little bit about Ferminergia, how we uh, got together. We we understood very simply. No one else is going to do that work that we have been doing. The government doesn't have the political motivation. They are afraid. The existing utilities, they are scared. They want to uh, maintain their assets and they, are, um, uh, they don't have the motivation and incentive to do uh, something uh, risky. So that is why Elon Musk is uh, uh, revolutionizing uh, in a, uh, vehicle business uh, and not uh, GM or, or any of the old, old folks. And uh, that is normal. That is normal how uh, disruption happens, happens in the market. So we are very pleased, uh, however, to cooperate with strong utilities uh, and nations that are committed to carbon neutrality. Uh, we understand that uh, capability raising and capital raising step by step absolutely makes sense. And um, you don't need all the money up front. And therefore, if you're very active in public engagement, it is extremely supportive from from perspective of money raising. It works hand in hand. It has worked for uh, for Tesla certainly. Uh, we are very transparent, and we also believe in, in justice to be make a fair value proposals to municipalities and the states. Um, and that you have to also innovate. But in innovation, you have to keep balance between uh, doing being too innovative and and uh, meaningfully. Uh, two feet on the ground uh, with pro uh, proven technology. And uh, that is one of the reasons that, that uh, we are, yeah, uh, have down selected to the technologies uh, that, um, yeah, yeah, we believe that, that, that are practical from our perspective. We're cooperating very closely with our, with our friends. This year we're studying with uh, Tractabel, Vattenfall and Fortum, uh, the ultra safe technology very deeply. Maybe next year another technology. And, uh, and uh, we in, in January, we had on our conference the Tallinn Declaration on SMR licensing. So here is a list of the studies that we have done for two years. And the studies were committed uh, this year. So we have uh, something like uh, 300,000 uh, annual budget for studies alone. So, uh, and we're preparing for some uh, practical uh, regulatory or uh, official um, proposals to the government uh, this year. And this is uh, the process that we are looking at, uh, given that we are starting Greenfield. Uh, obviously, we can't go to construction permitting right now. First, we have to have the formation of the nuclear energy regulator and uh, approval of, of the special plan and decision principle following the Finnish uh, model. Uh, and then the vendor choice, uh, final vendor choice, and then final investment decision, hopefully by 2030, maybe maybe sooner, maybe sooner. And this, at the same time, there are a lot of things happening in, in the energy and technology space that are, I believe, are supportive. Uh, so yeah, I uh, to to yeah to uh, pull it together very shortly. I believe that SMRs uh, are definitely financi financeable uh, in their development phase. We are not yet there whether I can confirm whether it is financeable in construction phase, but I, uh, I'm fairly confident that as the OPG and TVA projects move forward, 
uh, first of a kind issues will be solved, the uh, supply chains developed, the licensing uh, executed with um, capable regulators, then uh, yeah, those projects, multiple projects will be financeable also in the construction phase, uh, even without uh, implicit uh, or e explicit uh, uh, government uh, support mechanisms like, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kalaf. Uh, thanks for sharing your, um, just letting us know about your work and sharing your experience. Uh, very encouraging. So moving on, we have Ms. Winnie Newby, who will explain the specific challenges and opportunities for financing SMRs in Kenya. Uh, Ms. Dubai is Director, Strategy and Planning at the Kenya Nuclear Power and Energy Agency. She is also an economist with 18 years of experience in Kenya's power sector. She has previously worked with Kenya's largest power generating utility, the Kenya Electricity Generating Company, where her tasks focus on business development, strategic planning, and operation, and, and operation analysis. Now, at the Kenya Nuclear Power and Energy Agency, Ms. Nubai is responsible for various technical studies, including the pre feasibility study for Kenya's nuclear program, the 15 years nuclear roadmap, and she also oversees the development of nuclear policies and strategies. And recently she spearheaded the development of her agency's five-year strategic plan that encompasses the role of R&D coordination and capacity building in the energy and petroleum sectors in Kenya. Uh, Winnie, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria, for that fantastic uh, uh, introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening. I'm happy to be here to present uh, the case for Kenya uh, for the consideration that we have for small and modular reactors. So this will be uh, the outline of my presentation. I will begin with uh, a discussion on the national energy focus and uh, Kenya's nuclear power program uh, approach. Uh, we will also discuss the considerations for SMRs, the competitiveness that we see is a great opportunity. We shall also discuss the financing opportunities and challenges and uh, the concluding remarks. So in terms of the national energy focus, um, our government has three major considerations uh, for any inclusion of uh, technologies or, or power projects. The first one is the adequacy of power. Uh, which, uh, which is critical for us because we are looking at um, satisfying the demand that has been growing. We have a national development plan that is called the Kenya Vision 2030, which uh, looks at having Kenya as a middle income country by the year 2030. In that plan, there's a significant number of projects uh, that are anticipated to have a large demand for power. And so the adequacy of power becomes very critical. The other issue is reliability, which means consistent and available power as and when it's needed. And of course, one of the biggest one is competitiveness. So these are the three major critical factors that uh, we are looking at as we consider even the SMRs. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to just have a brief discussion on uh, the nuclear power program uh, approach that we're using in Kenya. We are following the International Atomic Energy Agency milestone approach, which of course we all know is a three-phase approach. And in phase one, uh, we had a political decision that was made for uh, the nuclear energy inclusion in the energy mix. Following that, our, our organization was established and we developed a 15-year roadmap which gave an outline of all the activities that needed to be implemented for all three phases. So we have a roadmap and uh, clear timelines for that. We have also undertaken several technical studies, the pre-feasibility study for the nuclear power program, the grid study, siting studies have also been undertaken, preliminary siting studies. And uh, there has also been development of national policies and strategies on the radiation waste uh, management, as well as uh, nuclear fuel cycle, nuclear security and physical protection, as well as um, a preliminary human resource development strategy. These have really been high level uh, policy documents that are guiding implementation of the program. We have also embarked on legislative and regulatory uh, aspects, 
uh, in 2019, uh, the first uh, the, the, the first major national law, nuclear, was, was, uh, was enacted, and this established the Nuclear Regulatory Authority that is now overseeing the implementation of the nuclear power program. We have also had international um, nuclear review missions, integrated nuclear infrastructure review, EPRE, which uh, focuses on the emergency preparedness, as well as the IRS, which was focused on the regulatory um, aspects. So we currently cons uh, uh, in phase two of the, of the implementation of the program. And what we are basically doing is developing uh, comprehensively the various infrastructure issues to ensure an efficient uh, program. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the considerations made for small and modular reactors, uh, initially when the nuclear power program was uh, conceived in Kenya, uh, the program was conceived with the consideration of only large reactors. At that point, we had very ambitious uh, power development plans, which uh, had indicated significant growth in demand. And therefore, the system was able to fit in uh, large reactors. However, this was a very optimistic position because uh, th that uh, may not have uh, uh, developed as opt optimistically as we had envisaged. Therefore, we have had a significant, significantly low uh, power demand growth. And so um, the large reactors are no longer considered um, proper for fitting into the system because our system is pretty small as you will soon see. Therefore, we have had to consider smaller units even as we develop our nuclear power program. Um, we have also, we are also seeking to uh, accrue the additional benefits that are presented by the small and modular reactor technologies. And so these are the, really the major reasons why uh, we have made a change of consideration from the large reactors in the initial part of the program to the small and modular reactors. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, position in Kenya for SMRs, I did indicate our grid is pretty small. We are currently at about 3000 megawatts, uh, but I must say this is a capacity that has developed uh, significantly quickly because just about seven years ago, we were at about 1000 megawatts. So there has been tripling of the capacity of the grid within about seven years. Uh, we are also looking at uh, SMRs as attractive because of the reduced impact of capital costs. And of course, this, in, this uh, introduces an affordability aspect for, for Kenya. Kenya is a developing country which has got significant other requirements for capital. We have so many sectors uh, that um, are competing for the resources. Uh, so uh, reduced uh, capital cost presents a very um, positive uh, consideration for, for us as we consider nuclear. The modularization also introduces um, a, 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 a case for cost savings. And also the fact that um, the modularization uh, means that you can be able to make the investment at, 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 a spaced, at a spaced timeline also means that the capital requirement will not fall, um, fall into place at, at, a, at a go. So that also is very attractive. Also, as we have seen from Ms. Cameron's um, presentation, there are numerous and diverse technologies that are currently being developed and that are very advanced levels of development. So this is also something we are very interested in, in um, pursuing and really looking at what technology would be best for Kenya. The fact that uh, these uh, units are smaller and uh, they also introduce simpler technological options also is an attractive uh, case for us. Next slide, please. Uh, again, um, the fact that uh, we, we see that the size, the small size of SMRs could be considered uh, to have uh, a reduction in economies of scale, but in our considered view from the analysis that we have done and also from what the market presents, uh, this diseconomies of scale could be overcome by several factors that are very specific to um, SMRs. For example, when there's shortening of construction time, of course, there's a lot of uh, savings in terms of the interest during construction. 
and that also uh, will, will, will bring about a more positive effect even to what would be considered a diseconomy. Also the option of load following and uh, the other alternative uses of cogeneration. Um, for Kenya, we, are, um, we have a considerable amount of water, but this has been projected to reduce significantly in future as the population grows and as they are competing uh, economic development uh, requirements. So desalination is becoming a very key uh, element even in our consideration of SMRs. Uh, the possible um, use for district heating and also hydrogen production, which is becoming very important for many manufacturing and uh, technological processes. Um, I have said that uh, the, the, the modularity will also allow incremental construction of reactors, which also presents uh, an affordability option for the country. And the factory fabrication also potentially brings about uh, the potential for reducing maintenance costs during operation due to the improved quality of components. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, the financing, financing of power projects in Kenya have been uh, quite a challenge for some, some of the projects. And, but we see uh, significant financing opportunities because again of the advantages that come um, with, SM, with SMRs. The lower capital requirements uh, due to uh, the significantly reduced uh, construction time and also the design simplifications also present a good case for a significant uh, lower cost. I'm very, very interested to see uh, what, what kind of costs uh, will be presented uh, by the, 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 the vendors or the proposers of, of SMRs, but we see a very great potential of cost savings from that. And also uh, the fact that uh, for, for us in Kenya, we, we feel that financing can be enhanced by power purchase agreement with the Oteka. Most of our, actually all the projects that we have in Kenya are already guaranteed by power purchase agreements. And so uh, that has not been a problem in the past. And we, th this is um, the format that the government intends to take in terms of future power projects. So we also see that um, if the SMRs is, uh, is introduced in the middle, medium term, this would be the same. And so uh, it would be the, the financing risks would be pretty much covered by the power purchase agreements. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the challenges uh, that we see for SMR financing, uh, the fact that uh, these are new technologies, uh, there is a requirement that has been put across by many of our stakeholders. Whenever we have engaged on nuclear, uh, nuclear related subjects, be it the large reactors or small modular reactors, they always tell us no first of a kind. So there will be a requirement for um, some provenness to a great extent because the stakeholders have made that a very key consideration for acceptance of the program. So um, I think stakeholder uh, acceptance is a key issue even for when it comes to financing. So that would be the potential challenge I would see, but with the kind of speed that most of the developers are moving it, I'm sure we will have several proven technologies within the medium term. Um, we also consider, um, uh, because most of the SMR projects would be um, fast in, 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 different, um, in different countries or in different jurisdictions, the financing risks could also come not just within the countries of origin, but also in Kenya, where this would be the first uh, power project related to nuclear. So just the, 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 the fact that this, is the, 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 this would be the first nuclear power plant um, that would be implemented in Kenya, I think uh, other than the first of a kind issue, the fact that this is the first nuclear power plant, then that would uh, be an issue that, uh, that may need some surmounting. But I believe that subsequent uh, units would, uh, would already have overcome that that challenge. Also the issue of uh, the perceived lower profitability of um, SMRs re relative to large reactors, uh, but we believe that this can be eliminated, eliminated incrementally because of the economies that, came, that come with multiple units. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of uh, my concluding remarks, I think one of the biggest issue that uh, I see of great significance to Kenya is the competitiveness of whatever technology that is introduced. So there will be a lot of need for us to get good information that we can be able to introduce in the national planning process and be able to justify the competitiveness of SMRs in Kenya. So far, all the power planning that we have done at the national level has only considered large reactors because uh, that is where we have a lot of information uh, that uh, can be used for planning. However, we're looking forward to getting detailed information that can be able to um, uh, give a chance for SMRs consideration in the national plans. Uh, and within that, uh, we also feel that um, the competitiveness of the SMRs should also be significantly high so that it can also be able to compete with the other technologies. Kenya is very rich with geothermal, uh, with the geothermal resource. So of course the government's priority is to enhance the development of the local resource. We also have a lot of solar and wind. So the competitiveness becomes a very, very key issue. But we are very confident that um, a lot of work is going in the, in the development of SMRs and this will introduce competitiveness. The other issue is that uh, there are other areas of SMR competitiveness other than size. For example, there could be the issue of decarbonization. Right now, Kenya does not have the problem of, of carbon because we have a lot of green energy. But as we continue to put in more, um, more investments in the power sector, there are lots of thermal power projects that that have been put uh, online for implementation. So decarbonization will also become an issue for us at some point. But most importantly, the fact that we need a technology that can have smooth or uh, seamless integration with variable renewable energy uh, generation, that is significant for us because we also have a lot of renewable energy technologies and uh, projects that are envisaged to come online in the short term and the medium term. So thank you very much uh, for, for, for listening to me. I will be looking forward to questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Winnie, for sharing the Kenyan experience. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure IFNAC is very uh, interested and look forward to working closely with Kenya in developing your national nuclear program. So now let's move on to hear from vendors. Uh, Mr. Jeff Harper is the VP for Strategy and Business Development at X Energy. Mr. Harper directs long-term business plans, specifically focused on customers, partners, and markets. He has 30 years of entrepreneurial general management and nuclear power industry experience in Africa, Europe, and the U.S. Before joining X Energy, Mr. Harper worked at the Westinghouse Advanced Reactors Program where he was a commercial business development pro program leader and the initial commercial leaders for his small modular light water nuclear reactor program. Um, and at the same time, Jeff also served as a vendor inspector for the USNRC, where he led more than 30 management, technical, and quality assurance inspections and audits of nuclear power plants and vendors. He serves on the Nuclear Energy Institute Supplier Advisory Committee the Nuclear Alternative Projects Technical Advisory Board on Puerto Rico. And, uh, and from 2018 to 2020, he was the vice chair for the US Department of Commerce Civil Nuclear Trade Advisory Committee uh, Six Charter. Um, Jeff is also a frequent speaker on advanced nuclear technology and commercialization. He received a bachelor degree in metallurgical engineering from the University of Cincinnati and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. So Jeff, please tell us SMR deployment is good news, not fake news. Thanks. Thank you very much. You did all the hard work with that, uh, that introduction. I appreciate that. Welcome everyone. Um, uh, special thanks to uh, IFNEC and uh, IFNEC Chair Alicia Duncan and also NEA, Honorable Bill Magwood. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to discuss this very important topic. Um, good news or fake news? Uh, well, these, this is unfolding. Uh, so let's start off by talking about uh, X Energy. X Energy, uh, those who know X Energy, um, we design uh, 
reactors and fuel. Uh, namely, we have our uh, workhorse reactor, I like to call it the XC100, which is a high temperature gas uh, reactor. Um, it's fueled by triso fuel and uh, what we call pebble form. Uh, we also have a uh, mobile reactor, uh, which is really focused on Department of Defense applications. Uh, this reactor is uh, one, one megawatt, so really uh, less than five megawatts. Uh, and then we have uh, our triso fuel. Uh, uh, we uh, produce the triso fuel. Um, and the pebble form in all forms. And we're looking to serve the entire market, not just the XC100 with our, our fuel. Uh, and finally, we have uh, a large effort in uh, space applications. So, uh, you know, thermal propulsion and also uh, lunar surface uh, power. So just a bit about the, um, what makes our XC100 uh, namely, uh, it's modular, so our standard plant would be 320 megawatts electric, uh, meaning that we would have four modules uh, of 80 megawatts electric. Um, our fuel, uh, you know, we look at the, uh, actually the pebble uh, uh, form of fuel here, the triso fuel is being really a game changer because we, we look at the safety case being within the fuel itself. Um, and then uh, the ability uh, for flexibility. So uh, electricity production, uh, but the exciting thing is the process, uh, process heat that comes, comes there. Um, high, quality, high quality process heat, uh, looking at 565C, 16.5 MPA. Um, and that allows us to, again, service the uh, water desalinization, uh, also provide the petrochemical industry. Um, you know, district heating can be done. And also, I guess the, the crown would be uh, hydrogen production uh, is also possible with this uh, high temperature uh, steam. The flexibility, uh, which is another aspect of uh, you know, the XC100's capabilities, which would bear itself out with really working with renewable energy um, and, and, you know, and what we call our load following uh, capability. So uh, you know, we're, we're able to couple with renewables and uh, we can ramp our reactor from 100% uh, power down to 40 and back up again, uh, you know, 5% five, five, uh, percent per minute, which is very, uh, it could be very useful in those applications. I, you know, you keep coming back to square one with nuclear power and this not only for X energy, but the power density uh, of nuclear is just uh, really, really a huge asset. And uh, in our case, the pebble you see here, um, you know, two point, we, we look at it, our pebble, one pebble itself being equivalent to 2.6 metric tons of coal. And you could see the rest. Um, and each reactor, we have about 220,000 of these pebbles. So you can see the attractiveness um, that we're trying to capture. Um, I think, uh, you know, Bill Magwood, uh, Alicia Duncan, Diane Cameron all made mention of this earlier, is the time is now. And, you know, we're seeing at least in the U.S. and, and uh, frankly across the globe that there is this unprecedented convergence. Um, and, you know, we've got the climate, uh, climate change crisis along with not only X Energy in terms of uh, you know uh, technology innovation in this space, but others as well. So we have that and political alignment. I mean, um, with the new administration in the U.S. Uh, and we just see it across the globe. We hear about you know carbon prices uh, and and uh, you know and it, it's just really an unprecedented time, which 
Uh, we've heard that we've seen this picture before in terms of, uh, you know, uh, maybe being the time, but I, I think now is, is uh, our, at least our view at X Energy is the time. So uh, a lot of pressure uh, and, and every day we, we get up at X Energy, we think about deployment, um, deployment, 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 and this decade. Um, having said that, we have three uh, major uh, efforts underway at the company, one in the microreactor space, uh, the DOD, um, we were down selected in, in a process to finish the design and deploy. Um, we were down selected with uh, DWXT. Uh, DOD has the Department of Defense, sorry, has the uh, option to choose either, either of us or both of us. Um, they're going to make the selections uh, in March of next year. That's the plan. And the winner or winners will benefit for uh, approximately 300 megawatt uh, market within DOD. Um, we are uh, extremely excited about uh, working, um, you know, in Canada with uh, Ontario Power Generation OPG. Uh, we're very optimistic there. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, we were down selected with two other uh, competitors, GE and Terrestrial Energy. We will learn this year if we will be selected to uh, deploy uh, our reactor at the Darlington site. And uh, the commissioning date there is 2028. So indeed this decade. Um, and finally, uh, uh, but uh, not least, not last or at last, but not least, sorry, uh, would be the, uh, in our own home country uh, in Washington state, we've, uh, we've teamed with Department of Energy on what we call the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program there. Um, we are looking to uh, work with Energy Northwest uh, there in Washington again to deploy by uh, 2027 is the plan. The overall, um, the overall cost of the project in terms of the fuel licensing, uh, cost of deployment all in uh, 2.2 billion, 2.4 billion dollars. Um, we're looking uh, at, uh, very grateful to DOE uh, for this program. Uh, they're looking to match a uh, 50%, uh, match that 50%, uh, uh, that cost 50%. So in other words, 1.2 billion uh, in partnership from DOE. Uh, so ourselves and TerraPower uh, have been selected for that, uh, that particular opportunity. And we're very optimistic that uh, that you know this this also we will be able to launch uh, this decade. So between uh, the three, we're optimistic that we can launch this decade. At uh, at X Energy, our thinking and deployment is really in three different spheres here: uh, public uh, public and regulatory commercial, technical. I want to unpack the um, public and regulatory and also commercial and some of our thinking and challenges and approaches. The technical, as Dan Cameron pointed out uh, earlier, is uh, something that we are very comfortable with and we have uh, a handle on. Um, it's the other two that become wild cards, especially when you're looking at uh, invest investors and working with uh, strategic partners. So this just gives you um, a very, very high level uh, way that we think about uh, deploying in the, uh, the commercial sphere. Um, we're looking at, you know, three uh, different areas, I would say markets, if you will, electric power utilities, uh, the industrials, uh, which would include also include these integrated energy systems. In other words, the uh, you know, water, desal, the uh, hydrogen, uh, all of these type markets. And then again, there is this new frontier, which 
distributed power markets where, um, it, you know, it, I think the future of this technology is going, especially in areas where the grid is, is, is not uh, as robust or is not as large, um, and maybe even some industrial applications. Um, so if we go back to the electric power utilities, uh, you know, there are all kinds of commercial arrangements, but typically we're looking at license or technology uh, licensing agreements with them. They would own the plants. So we're looking at a build, operate, transfer model. Uh, and, and that is quite simple, the financing, uh, simple, relatively speaking. Um, you know, utilities are not looking to invest in, in, in X energy or any subsidiary um, project company or anything like that. So it's pretty, pretty much a straightforward uh, transaction. Um, project financing utility is, is, is uh, mainly going to handle uh, handle that. So there's, uh, there's really uh, a straightforward as these go. If we look at the industrials, though, that's where we start looking at the opportunities to be strategic partners with these industrials. Um, and typically, what we've seen, and as we've discussed in the market now, they're still wanting to own um, but uh, they're wanting you to build, they're wanting you to operate, and they're wanting you to manage because most times they don't have experience in nuclear. Um, and then to contain the risk, uh, there is, you know, there would be some talk of setting up a, a, a separate company um, or either they may even be interested in investing in X Energy itself. So, we, we, you know, we're looking at all different scenarios there. Uh, but the, the big prize is the you know, new frontier market. As we start thinking uh, long-term in the future, um, this is where you're working in situations where there's really no, uh, uh, no nuclear background or, uh, or whatnot. And we're looking at setting up a project company and looking at building, owning, operating, and managing. Um, and this is going to require complication when it comes to, uh, to financing, relatively speaking, um, because you're looking at uh, enterprise financing. You're also looking at potentially project financing, which is very foreign to nuclear. And there are some folks that say um, it's, uh, it might be a real, real stretch. Um, I would say if we look at where we are now from an investor point of view, um, you know, I just wanted to give you a glimpse into some of the discussions and some of the, uh, I guess, uh, uh, perceptions that uh, we get into uh, when, when we uh, engage with these investors. Uh, again, if we unpack the the, the political and the regulatory sphere, which is the hard one. Uh, they're all hard, but this one is, is particularly hard. Um, public perception uh, that supports nuclear energy. Um, we are all looking for projects that um, this is not a large hurdle. Uh, just so happens that our ARDP project and uh, with Energy Northwest in Washington State, um, they've been really, there's this the Clean Energy Transformation Act. They're talking about eliminating coal by 2026 and zero carbon electricity by 2045, which is uh, very, very good support uh, for making the case uh, of for small modular reactors and namely uh, XC100. If we look at Canada, for example, Canada has been a uh, leading this area um, in, in really this public support, uh, or at least uh, on, the, on the Canadian government side, um, you know, with OPG, this project, um, there's carbon tax there. Uh, Dan Cameron, uh, you start, you have to thank her and all the work that she did with, uh, you know, Natural Resources Canada for the SMR roadmap and then the SMR action plan, it just sets the stage 
uh, for us in, in this area. So investors who look at this and the comments we've gotten for them from them is obviously carbon prices uh, are going to drive a lot of the our acceptance of, of working with you as a company um, and investing. But we, we look at these policies and uh, it, it helps us with our confidence. Public perception, it, uh, can, you can get all of the other aspects of nuclear right and this could kill you. And so uh, if you get this wrong, so you know, with the, in Washington state, for example, with our ARDP project, um, I have to tell you the community support is overwhelming um, and also even to the labor union support looking at uh, potential job creation in the future. Uh, we've been very encouraged here. Um, and so are the investors that we've been working with. Um, and again, with the OPG project considerations, um, you know, we're looking at siting at uh, Darlington site, which is an existing nuclear facility. Um, and there's an incumbent uh, nuclear industry in Canada um, and, and folks there are very familiar with, uh, with you know, nuclear and the benefits, um, all the above. So, I mean, you know, the comments that we've been getting on the projects that we have now uh, facing us from investors is uh, very high confidence. Um, finally, it, we look at the regulatory and licensing and permitting. Uh, again, uh, in the States, the NRC, um, you know, there's movement here uh, for the risk-informed licensing approach. Um, our timelines are aggressive, and we're looking at a 2027 deployment. But the uh, good news is that our site um, here in Washington State is well characterized. Um, actually, uh, there was going to be a nuclear project on the site we're looking at, and uh, so a lot of the environmental data is still there. Um, so we're sorting through all that now. Um, and then on the, from the OPG uh, point of view, um, you know, good news here is the CNSC um, is very experienced with high temperature gas reactors. They know them well. Um, there have been several vendors that uh, have gone through or are going through, uh, I should say, their vendor uh, uh, their VDR pro, uh, uh, process. And uh, Darlington is well, well characterized. The site is well characterized. So in a nutshell, um, you know, the feedback we're getting from investors uh, in their decision process once they looked at the numbers, et cetera, uh, you know, this is a medium to high area of confidence for them in their decision process, uh, most difficult um, the timelines are aggressive, uh, you know, uh, there's risk there. Um, the best we can do as X Energy to mitigate that risk is to uh, provide a, the, the agencies, the regulatory agencies, um, the best application we can. And so we've, uh, we've engaged in this pre-application discussion. Uh, it seems like it's a long cycle time for that, but uh, best to get all of these issues and, and uh, approaches ironed out prior to submitting an application, uh, running up you know, time, energy, and cost, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, deal with, sit with situations that, that maybe should have been dealt with upfront. That's what I have to offer. Great, thanks a lot, Jeff. I uh, really appreciate um, sharing your, your experience, the effort and achievement of X Energy. Uh, now, our last but not least speaker today is Mr. Uh, Jia Xu Tian, who will tell us how SMR can be a game changer for nuclear power. Mr. Tian is the president of Parlong Nuclear Power Technology in China and also the vice chief engineer of China National Nuclear Corporation, CNNC. Um, he is certainly a distinguished professional in nuclear. He has over 40 years of work experience in nuclear power generation. 
He established the China General Nuclear Power Group, CGN, and served as the president previously. He was also the president of CGN's uh, R&D Institute, the director general of the Nuclear Safety Center of the Ministry of Environmental Protection, and the director general of the Nuclear Power De Department and the R&D De Department of the CNNC. Uh, Mr. Tian is also uh, an expert group member of the Gen 4 Forum, GIVE, um, a vice chair of the Standardization Committee of China Nuclear Society and a member of China National Science and Technology Award Committee, uh, and as well as the China National Standardization Committee. Um, so please join me to welcome Mr. Tian. Thank you, Gloria. So, hi. Hello, everyone. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to share some of my knowledge on SMR as a, a, a very basic I mean, pre-thinking on that. So I will focus, next slide, please. So I will focus on the four points. One is the market outlook, uh, then the change from the SMR for the uh, commission financial model. The impact of uh, SMR on finance, finance model and the uh, government policy, and uh, some suggestions on the finance activity in the future. So next, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So uh, the climate goal and the uh, uh, nuclear energy uh, is what we have the environment to, to discuss the nuclear energy and uh, the SMR in the future. So based on the Paris climate agreements and uh, the China's three, uh, 30, 60 carbon, uh, carbon reduction target. So the Chinese uh, government announced uh, officially to achieve the carbon uh, peak by 2030 and the carbon uh, neutrality by 2060. So uh, achieving uh, uh, carbon peak by 2030 and the carbon neutrality by 2030 China currently uh, accounts for more than 65% uh, of coal-fired power plant. So that means it's a big challenge for the future. So next slide, please. Please, next slide. Okay. So as, oh, previous slide, please. You can do it one moment. Okay, for nuclear as a dispatchable power with high energy, it's possible to become an important basic energy source in China. But I know for uh, 2020, China has already a uh, 5,102 uh, kilowatt of nuclear power. Uh, by the government announcement in the future, the developing nuclear power has become a long-term stable strategy for China. It's very important. So that means by 2025, uh, we will have uh, 70,000 megawatt nuclear power in operation. By 2035, we will have 200 megawatt nuclear power in operation under, under construction. Generating about 10% of uh, country's electricity uh, installed. So nowadays we have only 4% uh, of uh, electricity share. So next slide, please. Next slide, simple. Uh, so China's policy and action for SMR development. So Chinese government has uh, announced the uh, SMR will be developed uh, and uh, is uh, scheduled uh, put into uh, the market by 2035. Uh, so it is said in the 14th, uh, 14th five years planning. So research institutions have carried out extensive research on small module reactors and uh, has preliminary R&D experience and the technology reserved. There were several, uh, several concepts, but one has already put into demonstration. 
China has first a small module reactor we call the ACP-1000 demonstration. So it, it is scheduled uh, to have the first concrete next month. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So the feature of SMR, so we have talk, uh, discussed a lot, so I will not uh, talk more on this uh, slides. So next one, please. So please, yeah. So the taking new features of SMR are more compatible with the need and market of China's inland than conventional uh, pressurized water reactor. What we have uh, special uh, requirements for inland because the inland in China is uh, uh, something different for the uh, cost side because inland is uh, much more, uh, I mean, uh, populated by, 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 I mean, the population is, is really high and uh, uh, so we need the inherent safety to reduce the, the risk and uh, uh, to reduce also the uh, cooling uh, source. And uh, so we also, uh, uh, to have a demand on the on the uh, less uh, uh, area for for the uh, crowded people of the the region the region. So uh, low power core reactors. Uh, so means uh, we develop uh, the uh, SMR uh, between uh, ten megawatt to uh, uh, three hundred megawatt. Uh, it's more uh, type, uh, adaptable for uh, various uh, uh, need. So small module reactor technically solves the key safety issues on PWR and can be a major uh, complement of large PWR. So SMR has also an optimistic outlook for Chinese uh, nuclear market in the future, especially for the uh, uh, inland uh, area. So. So we uh, ask for, or we will have uh, zero, or, or I mean the EPZ, uh, uh, there are no uh, uh, emergency prepar uh, preparedness uh, uh, planning in outside the uh, power plant. So next slide, please. Okay, next slide. So now uh, I will discuss a little more on, uh, about the changes on the finance model. So the SMR will be a game changer. Uh, we understand uh, the change compared with the traditional nuclear power design, procurement and construction uh, model. Uh, this is reflected by the following areas. First is a shorter uh, construction schedules, which will allow for reduced uh, financial cost or interest. Uh, the second one is for uh, individual projects, a decrease in construction and ins installation cost, but uh, uh, relevantly an uh, increase in the design and uh, equipment procurement cost, because it's uh, manufacture uh, uh, build and uh, will have integrated uh, characteristics. So oh, we say the design and the manufacturer cost will be uh, relatively higher than the others. So the small modular reactor R&D and the equipment manufacturer cost will be incurred before the project starts, which may lead to early cash flow peak, creating uh, investment pressure and risk from the supplier side. Next slide, please. So overall, the total investment in SMR individual projects is, is much more lower, reducing investment risk and allow for rolling development. But the investment risk and the pressure is shifted from the owner side to the supplier side and the other stakeholders. That's we have understand. So please, next, next slide. 
So in the typical PWR projects, the proportion of construction and the installation cost are relatively high. For SMR, on the other hand, has a much higher proportion on equipment high, uh, cost. Since the uh, short construction period, the cost of construction and the installation activities are all lower. So uh, financial costs are also significantly uh, lower. So you can see it's a, a commission of a large, uh, large reactors uh, cost portion. So you can see in China, we have uh, equipment cost take the share of uh, 34%. And the installation uh, share is uh, uh, 13 uh, percent, and the construction is 13 uh, percent. The increased cost is 15. So we estimated in the future for SMR case, the indirect cost and the equipment cost will be much more higher than this, but the others will be dec decreased. So next slide, please. So you can see it's a, a large reactor's uh, construction schedule. So the uh, cash flow uh, will be arranged like this one. I take the example is a six years uh, schedule. So it's for the, uh, we can see it's the normal schedule in China as a nuclear power construction. So next slide, please. And also we see, uh, we assuming that for SMR, uh, the construction, construction schedule will be seen in three years. So the cash flow will be uh, like this one. So the starting from the uh, design, the procurement uh, construction uh, installation commissioning. So we see with the last uh, construction schedule, we will save some money, but uh, uh, the cash flow will be uh, more forward. So next slide, please. So that's uh, some examples that we have uh, uh, supposed. So if uh, the investor from the customer, so uh, normally, so the customer will uh, pay for the site selection uh, for the procurement construction uh, and the installation. But if uh, the, uh, the payment or investment from the supplier side, so the R and D uh, and pre, uh, uh, I mean the manufacturer uh, component in the manufacturer will be uh, shifted to the supplier side. So the owner will take less risk for the uh, project itself. So next slide. Okay. So next slide. So as we see, the SMR is a game changer for finance. SMR is a game changer that will change the traditional nuclear design procurement and the construction procedures. The changes and the challenges would include the reallocation of finance risk between the demand side and the supply side and the whole supply chain. Compared with the traditional nuclear investment and the construction, the finance pressure on the demand side would decrease while the investment pressure is shifted to the supplier side. And who will supply and hold the supply, uh, supply chain? Now, how will this uh, redistribution happen and how to manage it? The R&D cost, SMR technology innovation require massive investment on the R&D work. With current technical maturity, it is difficult for SMR to attract capital with low risk appetite. 
who will pay for the R&D cost is the question. The, most, uh, the market size and the stability of support, supporting policies is important and necessary. So the sufficient user group and the stable government policy support are very important and necessary for maintaining the investment expectations of the supply side and the supply and industrial chain. Try to, come, uh, try to catch the confidence for their own uh, investment and the risk control. Next slide, please. So the SMR uh, finance demand could be satisfied with the appropriate finance approach and uh, finance policies. So for the finance approaches, so during the phase of SMR and and V and V, as well as SMR project demonstration, investment from the government's state-owned investment institutions and the consortium should be introduced. In SMR pro project promotion phase, diversity, diversity investment will be introduced. So it's very important to, to see the supply side investment. We need a stable and continuous policy support from the government on SMR development are necessary for the banks to grant long-term loans with low interest to the supplier side. For the demand side, that means the utility or the end users, the investment will be attracted by sufficient market size. If uh, the, 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 the end user is limited, so we will have not the scaled effective uh, efficiency. So that means, so we need a relevant large and the user or user group to support the standardization and the uh, scaled uh, efficiency. So next slide, please. So from the financial policy, the financial policies are made, uh, formulated by the state and the local governments in accordance, in accordance with the needs of the development of SMR in various various regions and can be included in the following aspects. The formulated policy guidance on science and the technology funds and invest in the early stage of R&D. The formulated tax prefer preferential policy from the first batch of projects. The price protection and the consumption mechanism for the products means the electricity, the heating, the other uh, applications of the small module reactor projects. In response to the flexible regulatory requirements of SMR projects, the safety and the interest of investors should be both guaranteed. So next slide. So the discussion and the suggestions on the SMR's finance method. So we think about the following games participants are required to cooperate and unify their planning. The national policy making uh, department, the science and the technology funding department, the industrial management authorities and the bank. The innovative R&D institutions, industrial chain, and the project investors, owners, and operators. From the R&D to the SMR uh, installation, I mean the real NPPs, it is necessary to formulate detailed game rules in every link so as to clarify each responsibility and benefits from the whole uh, industrial chain, the investment and the risk control, the financial, financial and the cash flow needs and the allocation, the control of the resource and the return of the value. So detailed and reasonable game rules will ensure that 
the SMR's investment starting from uh, the startup, the R&D activities, the design, engineering, and procurement, construction and installation, commissioning and operation, and the maintenance are all the interlocked and smoothly promoted, allowing users to get an early return on investment, thereby improving the SMR's economic performance. Next slide, please. So as a summary, the, we can see the SMR have better safety performance and uh, scalable scalability. The SMRs and the large pressure reactor, uh, large PWR reactors have significantly different capital investment characteristic, uh, characteristics. The government support and the guidance is very important for us in the initial stage of SMR de development. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Tian. Um, I see that we are running out of time. Um, and for that, just let me, I think we only have time for a couple of quick questions. And as, as promised, all the uh, remaining questions will be posted. Um, so please let me uh, ask uh, maybe Mr. Harper. Um, we noticed that X Energy has been very successful, uh, at least successfully uh, short, being shortlisted. Um, for several potential XC100 uh, deployment projects. This has obviously resulted in the company uh, having to ramp up its staff and other resources uh, to catch the opportunity to meet this demand. So can you share with us what has been some of X Energy's biggest challenge in attracting and closing investments from new investors, please? Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the question. Lots of challenges, but even more opportunities. Um, so I think Cam Grafarian, who's our founder, has, has funded X Energy to 80 to $90 million himself uh, since the beginning of the company. DOE has been a, an excellent partner and several grants. Um, but as our growth, uh, our growth now dictates that we go to uh, the private market for investment, uh, we've attracted and we work with uh, the challenges working with investors who are, are not familiar with the nuclear industry and, uh, or nuclear technology. So uh, different cultures, we talk tech, they talk risk. Um, in some cases, there's nationality differences. So English being their second language, uh, it's, it's tough. So we have to find a common language that works for everyone. Uh, building trust, uh, we're looking for you know, big, big investments. Building trust uh, in a COVID environment is tough, um, but uh, we, you know, you, you approach it by, you know, management team engagement for doing these video conferences, uh, you know, team responsiveness to questions, uh, our cost buildup, you know, how do we get to our LCOE and justification? That's really important that we, we be transparent. Um, and sometimes you just can't can't avoid a face-to-face -face meeting. It just has to be done. Finally, on the risk side, uh, quantifying the risk, especially in the licensing area has been tough. Um, and not that we won't eventually be licensed, uh, but how long will it take? How much money? Uh, we're answering all those questions. If we go to different countries, uh, you know, just US, Canada, for example, um, you know, different, different licensing scenarios and requirements. Finally, the, uh, in that whole risk category would be valuations. So we, how do you get to a, a, a good valuation, a valuation everyone could live with? What are the justifications for it? What are the comps? What are discount rates? Um, so those are, those are just some of the things we deal with. Thanks, and, and that's very consistent uh, with what we continue to hear from our member countries. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, if, if I can take the time to ask maybe a second question, to me, this is an important question. Um, this is to Mr. Tian. Uh, can you tell us in your opinion, in your, in your experience, how do SMR developers uh, work with governments or influence governments to secure policy support? 
Okay, thank you. In my case, uh, the investment for the R&D, uh, almost the, uh, all from the government. And uh, uh, the government also gave a tax reduction for the uh, first batch of the folk. So not only one units, but maybe uh, nowadays we have uh, the first three units can be, uh, uh, can be founded or can be uh, can have the tax, uh, tax reduction and also filled in uh, tariff. I mean, the electricity uh, price uh, will be uh, uh, fixed uh, in some time. So uh, also it's very important. Uh, so we need, uh, I mean, so, uh, uh, big uh, 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 company like CNC can carry out the risk on the, uh, the demonstration. So in our case, uh, uh, the government uh, support program, uh, support the HTRPM uh, program uh, and the HTRPM now is coming to the commission, uh, commission phase and uh, is under the code uh, functional test and uh, hot function test. Then soon we'll come to the first uh, loading. And the uh, trestle fail uh, commercialized uh, manufacturer is ready to supply for the, uh, for the fuel. And uh, uh, for the uh, small scale, the uh, PWR, we call the ACP 1000. As I already uh, told you that, uh, uh, it is approved by the government for the engineering demonstration and uh, will be have their first concrete next month, but it's far away from the commercial uh, demonstration. So uh, nowadays, uh, the high temperature gas code reactor uh, demonstration, uh, the cost is uh, uh, relatively higher compared with the PWR. And uh, for the small scale the PWR, so uh, the demonstration uh, construction schedule uh, is forecast uh, around five years, but I, I have no confidence it will be <laughs> smoothly uh, progressed. So maybe it will take a, a little longer and uh, we will see because we can make a lot of paperwork but the fact is, how can we realize it? So for the HTRPM and for the ACP 1000 is one kind of engineering demonstration and we are looking forward in the future if it will have the commercial purpose or how can we achieve the commercial demonstration in the futures market anyway. So we try to, 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 to find the solution. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And, yeah, and, and I guess just like anything else, the, the sooner you uh, you start a dialogue with the relevant stakeholder, the better. Um, so uh, we probably can take a couple more quick questions. Um, let me ask Winnie this question. Winnie, um, you mentioned in your talk that the uh, you talk about the potential challenges for SMR financing. So can you tell us what is the greatest challenge in financing nuclear projects in Kenya? And how can this challenge be overcome in SMR financing, please? Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for the question. And. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, challenge uh, that I see with current power projects is um, the, the issue of government guarantees, uh, whether uh, in terms of um, additional guarantees, even further to the PPAs, sometimes uh, some investors do require further, further guarantees. So that has been a, a bit of a challenge for some of the projects. Another challenge uh, in currently for power pro projects would be social issues. Sometimes we have had projects that have, have gone through the full uh, length of even having signed PPAs, but social issues do, do come up. About two years ago, there was a coal power plant of about 900 megawatts that had been approved uh, to the final stage, but there were community issues that came up and the project was put on hold by the, by the courts. Uh, again, um, the issue of county governments. For the last uh, 10 years, Kenya has been um, uh, implementing a, a devolved system of government. 
So we have 47 counties in Kenya and these governments are taking a more active role. So in terms of how this can be overcome for uh, SMRs financing, I think uh, for, for the government uh, support, this will be very important, whether through PPAs or whether through even ownership of especially the first project, because uh, the people see, always trust the government more than they would trust private people. So I see that as a great enhancement of the financing of uh, the, the, the SMRs. Also the minimization of the risks that we have spoken about the first of a kind and uh, just demonstration that the issues that are brought forward by people in terms of management of radioactive waste, the minimization of those risks and the demonstration to the public and other stakeholders that this will have been uh, managed at a level, I think that important. The issue that comes for us is the regulator uh, because uh, this was the body that was previously overseeing uh, ionizing radiation uh, regulation and so there will be need for a demonstration that the regulator will have will be able to issues of the nuclear power program so that could also have an element of the confidence by coming into the country to invest. And finally, um, stakeholder engagement is very key. It can make or break um, the project, whether from uh, the financing point of view, because no investor will be interested uh, to have any uh, negative aspects on the ground. So that is very key. And uh, we have started doing that very proactively, even as we continue into the next phases of site characterization for the, for, the, for the nuclear site. So that is a very key issue for us, both in terms of the project success in all elements, including the- Great, thanks a lot, Uni. Now, I noticed that uh, Mr. Kalamats has to leave uh, shop at four o'clock. Um, so I, I do want to ask him one very quick question. Like, Kala, please, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, can you tell us what is the most important lessons learned that Fermi Energy uh, would give to countries, especially, let's say, um, embarking countries? Don't be afraid. Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, that's very, that's yeah. very uh, insightful. Um, thanks a lot for that. And yeah, and uh, more, more, uh, more. <laughs> More concretely, that uh, don't be afraid that uh, it is too difficult. Don't be afraid that it, it takes time. Don't be afraid to, that uh, that others will not necessarily support you straight away. Don't be afraid that uh, you have critiques. Don't be afraid of that. Be a be a grown up about that. And uh, if you're confident in yourself, that you are able to lead others. You're able to uh, instill confidence on, in others investing in your project. So uh, it's, uh, that is our national motto in, in Estonia, how we are independent. Don't be afraid. Yeah, that sure. is quite simple. Thank you. And uh, also don't be afraid to uh, become more active uh, international, in international activities. Uh, we can learn uh, from each other or we can learn from each other. So um, I see that our panelists are very efficient in answering the questions. Uh, we have got a number of questions already answered. So we, and we also don't have time for that. Um, we, to conclude this uh, webinar, I would like to invite uh, DJ Matt Wood and Chair Duncan to give their closing remarks, please. Uh, thank you. I'm going to use DG prerogative to ask my own question. <clears throat> and, and that this is really to Mr. To, to Kalov and to Winnie. Um, Kalov, in your comments, you said that you were looking at these demonstrations um, at TVA and uh, OPG very carefully. <clears throat> and Winnie, in your comments, you talked about the need for um, proven technology. What, what are you looking for? And maybe Winnie, you could go first. What, what do you see as as proven technologies, a technology that's been proven in a laboratory uh, setting or, or something that someone has built commercially? What do you see as proven technology? Thank you very much, uh, DG Magud, for that question. Um, I think uh, for us, uh, the proven technology would be the, the successful construction and operation of um, 
uh, first of a kind and the demonstration of um, uh, proper safety systems that, that will come with it. And of course, the economics also do come with it because uh, you want the whole infrastructure of this first of a kind to function properly. And you want a demonstration of that for a number of years. I don't think we have a defined number of years uh, yet, uh, but uh, I, would, I would give it between five to 10 years of, of safe mm -hmm. operation. Yeah, so that, that, that's my take on that. That's very interesting. Kyla? Yeah, very quickly. There was an excellent question in the Q&A about uh, risk allocation and uh, that uh, and uh, clearly the, the idea of putting all the risk on a developer or uh, on the vendor, all the risk on that uh, is, is, hasn't worked out, is, is resulting in a very expensive project. So you have to have a, some kind of a smart uh, risk allocation mechanism uh, that also avoids the obvious thing that, oh, everybody has to be in equity. So there, uh, we, we have to scratch your head and think that we are really in the, this new century and there are many opportunities to uh, have a risk allocation that is appropriate uh, at the same time uh, legally uh, certain and uh, that uh, you know uh, puts everybody in the same, uh, same, same boat, so to say, for, for at, at least uh, the, the construction time. At, uh, in, yeah, so uh, th that is... Um, that is, I'm, I'm looking forward how the, the, these utilities develop those contractual uh, methods, also knowing that they're kind of a little bit different entities compared to uh, us in Europe and in a different situation. So uh, that is, uh, and, and obviously, excellent project execution, learning on all the vocal mistakes and stuff like that. So uh, looking forward to that happening uh, very soon. I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> I think your, your, your comments, I think, are actually very important for people to hear. I'm sure the, uh, the, the Jeff and, uh, and, and Mr. T and they're listening very co closely because there's a very big difference between a laboratory demonstration, uh, which I think people are talking about, and commercial deployment, where you look at these economic issues. So that's, that's very important to highlight. Um, so with time um, having escaped, let me simply thank all of the speakers. They were excellent presentations. I learned some things here today, and uh, there's a few things to take forward. And I will close my remarks by saying, here is Alicia to close this out. Alicia, please. Thank you so much, Director General Magwood. I want to thank you and the, F the NEA uh, team, both uh, NTE and the Technical Secretariat, um, our colleagues from Poland, and the IFNEC membership for organizing such an amazing event. Um, I was very interested in all of the presentations and so glad that our IFNEC membership uh, came through once again with their presentations. One of the things that we have thought about in IFNEC is how we engage industry more um, with the work of IFNEC and obviously there is um, huge value in making sure that we have all of our partners uh, in these types of discussions. So I wanna offer to you, and I'm gonna surprise uh, Gloria and DG Magwood, I wanna offer to you the opportunity that IFNEC at its next steering group meeting will invite it, be inviting industry um, as observers only just to listen into that conversation that we'll be having as we look to discuss our scope and matters of priority. Uh, that information will be available on the IFNEC website. So this will be our first effort and first time ever, including industry in a steering group meeting. Um, so I think that's a, an opportunity for you to learn more about us and further engage um, as we move forward. I also would be remiss if I did not um, say a special hello to a previous IFNEC steering group chair who's joined us today, Julian Godano. Um, it is a pleasure to have you with us. And most importantly, I wanna thank all of the participants who joined us today and hope that you will come back again for the uh, remaining sessions for these series. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, thanks again for your interest and, uh, and time. I hope to see you again. Until then, stay healthy, bye.